I'm Dr. Peter McCullough. I'm an internist and cardiologist from Dallas, Texas. And the title of my presentation is The Pathophysiologic Basis and Clinical Rationale for Early Ambulatory Treatment of COVID-19. Now, these are my own opinions and not necessarily those of anyone else. I have no conflicts of interest to report. Let me go ahead and jump into the presentation. I'll follow this outline and make a few points with respect to each one of these bullets. The first is that the global crisis uh, needs no introduction at this point in time. We're well past a year uh, into SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 global pandemic crisis. There are two bad outcomes from this infection, and they include hospitalization and death. And it's clear that something must be done before the hospitalization in order to prevent a hospitalization. The major elements of the illness include viral proliferation, cytokine injury, and thrombosis. So it's clear that no single drug can treat COVID-19. Attempts to, to have a single drug cure COVID-19 are foolish in my view. And we should always work with multiple drugs. We look for drugs with a signal of benefit and acceptable safety. And we don't expect any single drug to have a positive clinical trial, but we use drugs in combination to treat COVID-19. The characteristic signs, symptoms, laboratory tests are all shown here. When patients die, it's almost always related to thrombosis. The spike protein, which is produced uh, in great quantities with viral replication is directly thrombogenic as responsible for the thrombosis. We use intracellular anti-infectives, antiviral antibodies, corticosteroids and immunomodulators, antiplatelet agents, and anticoagulants. It's a three-pronged approach to treat COVID-19. The pillars of pandemic response are important. We try to reduce the spread of the virus, but we know those efforts are uh, largely minimally effective. We really focus on early home treatment. That has the largest public health impact of anything we possibly can do. Late stage hospital treatment is necessary as a safety net for survival, but recent data suggests that hospital doesn't save all the patients. In fact, patients require the ICU at 28 days. There's a 38% contemporary mortality rate, unacceptably high. We must do something before the hospital in order to save the patient. And lastly, we look forward to herd immunity through natural infection. And then when vaccine can assist in this, we are seeing vaccine failures. And so we know that the vaccination will have, unfortunately, a low impact in terms of achieving herd immunity. It's gonna be through natural infection. So what's the role of early ambulatory treatment? There are anti-spike protein monoclonal antibodies that are directed against the spike protein, the Regeneron combination of uh, 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 the two uh, products, as you can see here, the uh, Regen Cove 2 antibody cocktail reduces hospitalizations uh, on a secondary endpoint to a modest degree. But if, if available, patients should get this infusion. We rely on oral hydroxychloroquine, the most studied and proven drug in COVID-19. It changes endosomal pH and works to reduce viral replication, changes some cell surface uh, proteins in terms of a better overall uh, immune defense against the virus. And hydroxychloroquine is relied upon in his first line treatment uh, in many countries uh, across the world. Now it's not used alone, but it's used in combination with other drugs. Here are the data. Uh, observational studies, about a 50% reduction in hospitalization. And keep in mind, there's uh, over 20,000 patients on this uh, uh, slide. So far and away, the most studied drug. Uh, here's a very large uh, recent analysis from Iran, 28,759 patients, 25% were treated, and it's about right, 25% of adults will need treatment, 200 milligrams twice a day in, in addition with other nutraceuticals and medications, about a 30% reduction in hospitalization, 60% reduction in death. Here are the outpatient randomized trials, about a 24% reduction in outcomes with COVID-19. So proven, safe, and effective hydroxychloroquine in COVID-19. Now, what's the problem with hydroxychloroquine? Well, the inpatient studies observationally confounded by indication, but showed variable uh, degrees of uh, benefit. And then the randomized trials, only two small randomized trials were prospective and double-blinded they were neutral for COVID-19 outcomes, probably because by that time the viral replication is long over with and patients are in a, a cytokine storm thrombosis state. Here is the um, NIH-sponsored uh, clinical trial in the United States, again, neutral for mortality, no benefit, but no harm. And then you can see here the overall uh, composite endpoints, numerically uh, more deaths with hydroxychloroquine than placebo, not statistically significant. Now keep in mind a trial like this is way underpowered. They would need about 
7,000 patients for this to be an informative trial, but suffice it to say, uh, hydroxychloroquine may not have a benefit extended deep into the hospitalization, but if doctors use it, I certainly wouldn't criticize them. Patients are critically ill. The outcomes are terrible with current treatment. Hydroxychloroquine uh, uh, certainly uh, offers no downsides and could be effectively utilized. Now, why have doctors and researchers really need access to hydroxychloroquine? It's because uh, it's a very valuable drug. My conclusion was the, the, really the literature had failed hydroxychloroquine, not the drug itself. So suffice it to say, uh, we shouldn't be confused by uh, opinion or by hubris or the media. We should follow the science. Science suggests hydroxychloroquine has a signal benefit, particularly in outpatients, and we use it on a daily basis. Ivermectin, this is an antiparasitic drug, which also impairs viral entry, viral replication through reducing it into the nucleus. It also has an inhibitory effect on the pathogenicity of the spike protein. All the clinical trials, as you can see here, six randomized trials, five observational studies, 71% reduction in mortality. Contemporary meta-analyses also confirm this. One recently from the Mayo Clinic, very comprehensive. Ivermectin, consistently beneficial. There's only one neutral trial, and that trial was published in JAMA recently and is considered invalid. And there's been, uh, I think, over 100 letters to the editor asking for that paper to be retracted. So ivermectin, safe and effective, and works uh, both inpatient and outpatient. Favipiravir, much less data. Favipiravir is an oral uh, RNA-dependent polymerase inhibitor. It has a modest effect in reducing viral shedding. It's a Japanese product. It's used, uh, is approved in uh, four in states in India, as well as in uh, five countries. And uh, favipiravir uh, outside the United States and North America is an option. And uh, we'd have to see more information uh, in order to bring this in, I, I would imagine, to, to North America. But in the absence of other treatments, it appears to be safe and effective and also is used to treat influenza. Corticosteroids, very important. Uh, what do we know here? Meta-analysis, multiple clinical trials, inpatient basis, 30% reduction in mortality. Not as big as hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin, but certainly corticosteroids play a role. If we add in the data from Fonseca, and others, we have outpatient uh, studies supporting the use of prednisone, and I think corticosteroids uh, are in the program. Inhaled corticosteroids, budesonide, pioneered by Dr. Richard Bartlett in West Texas. As you can see here in the STOIC trial, this trial is an outpatient trial in England, 139 patients, 87% reduction in the primary endpoint of uh, inhaled budesonide. High dose, 800 micrograms twice a day, but that's in the program. Colchicine, what we have here is the largest clinical trial in COVID-19. 4488 patients, 4159 PCR positive, prospective double-blind randomized control trial. Unfortunately, stopped early for administrative reasons. If it went to 6,000 patients as planned, it would have been uh, overwhelmingly positive on the primary endpoint. But what we have is with the um, restricted population of those who really had COVID, there was a 25% reduction in the composite endpoint. It was all driven through hospitalization, but very importantly, uh, colchicine reduced hospitalizations, very important, 25% reduction in hospitalization, strong mortality signal, 44% reduction in colchicine, very important. Anticoagulants, again, we address viral replication, cytokine storm, and now coagulation. What do we have here? There is a, about a 50 to 80% reduction with anticoagulation and aspirin used in the hospital, propensity matched analysis, uh, and then extended out to 28 days, full dose anticoagulation, Again, in hospitalized patients, this is uh, published from a very, very uh, excellent group in the United States. Joshua Beckman is a personal friend of mine. Uh, these doctors know what they're doing. Uh, anticoagulants, antiplatelet drugs clearly reduce uh, outcomes in COVID-19 and can be extended to the outpatient setting, in my view. How about putting it all together? Early sequence multidrug therapy. This is really encouraging. We have all these signals of benefit. Can we assemble the drugs into a regimen to reduce hospitalization and death? That's the question on the table in the absence of large randomized trials. And I can tell you the large randomized trials of using four to six drugs, as I've gone over with you, they aren't even planned yet. The guidelines that will depend on those clinical trials obviously have to wait for those clinical trials. So we're about two to four years away from anything what you're about to see. And in my view, the epidemic is too important. Lives are being lost. People are being needlessly hospitalized. Let's get going with, with uh, sequenced oral multidrug therapy and here it is. This is the published guidance, December of 2020. Keep in mind the IDSA, the NIH, CDC, WHO, uh, FDA, none of them give any advice on how to treat outpatients. This is the current state of the art. There are other groups 
uh, Frontline Critical Care Consortium and other groups, uh, IMAF and MATH Plus protocols, they actually are all embodied in the larger sequence multidrug approach. And here it is. Uh, this illness is amenable to risk stratification, age under 50, nor the medical problems. Simply a nutraceutical bundle of uh, uh, zinc, 50 milligrams of elemental zinc, vitamin D3, 5,000 units, vitamin C3, 3,000 milligrams, quercetin, 500 milligrams twice a day. These are modestly helpful to reduce deficiencies, help people get through the illness. People under age 50 uh, simply can clear the virus and return to work in their job. Those who, who are under 50 who present with severe symptoms, have comorbidities over age 50 with medical problems, obesity, diabetes, heart and lung disease, cancer, should get the full protocol. And that involves nutraceutical bundle, getting an antibody infusion if available, carries Vivimab and Indimivab, a, a combination available in the United States, great. Uh, moving on to two or more intracellular anti-infectives, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, or favipiravir with azithromycin or doxycycline. Uh, patients can get budesonide all the way through now, uh, and if respiratory symptoms are day five developed, take oral steroids, uh, prednisone or dexamethasone, or hydrocortisone are perfectly fine. We now use colchicine all the way through, 0 0.6 milligrams. Uh, if there's increased uh, venous thromboembolic risks beyond aspirin, 325 milligrams a day, we can use a full dose low mycoid heparin or full dose novel oral anticoagulants. So it's about four to six drugs that really are needed to treat COVID-19 as an outpatient to reduce hospitalization and death. Most of these drugs the patients would get anyway on an inpatient basis. And in my view, there's no reason not to extend these to the outpatient realm and markedly reduce the bad outcomes that we're seeing today in COVID-19. The only reason why patients are being hospitalized in any great number is because they're not being treated at home. So where are the data? Proctor uh, and others have published that this approach is related to approximately 85% reduction in hospitalization and death compared to expected values. Again, no randomized trials are even planned at this point in time. And so we must operate on the totality of information to save our patients today. This has led to uh, two US Senate hearings. I participated at the first one. You can see me holding up my protocol here. And then a second one focused uh, uh, from inpatient doctors, but on the use of ivermectin and other drugs. There have been letters sent to the National Institutes of Health we must pivot to an early ambulatory treatment of COVID-19. It's the only way to produce uh, reduc reductions in hospitalizations and death. I testified at the Texas Senate. We have legislation now to provide patients with early ambulatory treatment information, access to monoclonal antibodies, access to research. None of that was open to patients. And no wonder we were doing so bad with the pandemic response. There are now bills uh, organized to help support doctors in off-label use of drugs. And there are societies, Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, a leading society supporting early home treatment, COVID Medical Network in Australia, Terapia Domicilari, COVID-19 in Italy, Panda in South Africa, Heart and Bird in the UK. So this is a national, worldwide effort to get early ambulatory treatment for patients with COVID-19 and put this pandemic under control. There's a home treatment guide. We have data showing that this has now been downloaded millions of times it's probably responsible for sparing hundreds of thousands of lives and millions of hospitalizations. Probably the most frequently used document in all of COVID-19. It's available at aapsonline.org. It gives the protocol that I've given access to telemedicine services. In the United States, we have four national telemedicine services and 15 regional telemedicine services, all relying on the guide and the protocols to treat patients at home with this uh, um, multi-sequence early ambulatory treatment approach that we reviewed today. So to finish and conclude, COVID-19 pandemic is a global disaster. Its pathophysiology is complex. It's not amenable to a single drug. Despite contagion control efforts, the outbreak is worsening with two poor outcomes, hospitalization and death. The hospitalization and late treatment form an inadequate safety net with an unacceptably high mortality rate. Early ambulatory therapy with a sequence multi-drug regimen is supported by available sources of evidence and has a positive benefit to risk profile. It's designed to reduce the risk of hospitalization and death and more safely temporize to close the crisis with vaccination and natural herd immunity. I can't give a more clear and concise and important message to the world that COVID-19 should be treated as an outpatient. It is a treatable illness and its treatment 
has a large public health impact. Wearing masks and contagion control is not treatment. Vaccinations is not treatment. The biggest issue is that patients who are acutely sick with COVID-19 are at risk for being hospitalized or dying, and they must be treated with medications. Masks and vaccinations do not treat patients. It's very important. The focus on masks and vaccinations is distracting from the treatment of COVID-19. Very important. Vaccinations do not completely prevent COVID-19. We treat patients who fail the vaccination and develop COVID-19 the same way. Very important. Vaccine failures are treated the same way as de novo COVID-19 patients. Once patients recover from COVID-19, the natural immunity is robust, durable, and complete. It has a far more complete library of antibodies uh, against the spike protein, nucleocapsid, uh, multiple other uh, epitopes of the entire virion, and there is complete cellular immunity from T helper cells to natural killer cells and to innate immunity. With the vaccine, there is a very limited immunity only to the Wuhan spike protein only. And the library of antibodies is narrow and restricted. And it's not a surprise that the vaccine fails in some patients and they have a COVID-19 infection anyway. It is not a surprise that there'll be mutant forms of the virus that will be resistant to any of the vaccine-induced immunity and patients will need to be treated. Thus far, there have been no significant risks of reinfection with natural immunity, none. Antibody studies from Denmark, I think have been misleading and they have been inferred that patients get infected more than once. It's never been proven with any case material. And the existing cases that have been reported, about 100, each one of them represents a confused case of a false positive PCR on one occasion and a clinical infection on another occasion. We've had 111 million patients with COVID-19 in the world. If there was any significant chance of reinfection, we would see millions of recurrent hospitalizations, millions of cases of the same patient going on the ventilator uh, twice or more. We haven't seen that at all. So early ambulatory treatment of COVID-19 allows a patient to survive the infection and then be delivered to natural immunity, which is complete, robust, durable, and appears to be far superior to vaccination immunity. And it cannot be improved upon with vaccination superimposed on top of natural immunity. So I'll let that uh, be my last word. And thank you for joining us in this symposium.